All right, everybody. Um, our final keynote speaker today is Gigi Blanchard. And I first came in contact with Gigi after she reached out to me um, after reading about some research that I was doing on restorative juvenile justice. Um, and I was immediately struck by her passion for justice reform. It just, like, I, I was not expecting to come in contact with her, and it just felt you know, serendipitous. Um, so Gigi has had personal experience with the justice system and thus can offer a unique perspective on the actual impact that it has on those, of, um, those who find themselves on the wrong side of it. Um, she has transformed from someone trapped in a cycle of incarceration and state observation into an advocate for positive change. So please join me in welcoming Gigi Blanchard. Thanks. I am really excited to be here, partly because I escaped New York's a crazy storm yesterday. So it's really amazing also to be here around so much passionate people that are trying to affect change because when you're coming in, of age in the system, you often feel like an obstacle in somebody's eight hour shift. So thank you guys. And a shout out to also the extra credit students who are finding this interesting. Thank you guys as well. Um, so before I go into my uh, gritty story of coming age, I want to tell you guys a little bit about what I do now as an activist. And um, so yes, uh, Facebook and uh, tweets are a part of that. But in addition to that, I also work to get petitions signed. Um, in New York, where I live, we are trying to raise the age. Um, next to North Carolina, we're the only two states that currently charge 16-year-olds automatically as adults. And so we're trying to get the age raised on that. So that involves getting people to sign petitions and also calling politicians. And um, a second thing I do is what I like to call front door uh, activism. Um, some of you guys here are involved with that. And that's basically working hands on with detained youth. Um, for example, I teach a writing workshop at Rikers Island. So that is New York's notorious jail. But um, like I said before, we charge kids as adults there, so I teach the adolescents there. And um, we teamed up with a West Coast zine called The Beat Within. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but it's a really amazing zine that features voices from within. And it's been really amazing to see you know, a young person's face light up whenever their piece is published. You know, all of a sudden they have a voice and their story matters. Um, so that's been really amazing. And a uh, second thing I do is work with unaccompanied minors. And um, these kids are kids that are uh, detained through ICE and detained in detention centers in New York. A lot of times the kids are trying to unite with family that are out here or in Texas or California. And what we do is meet with them weekly to try to get an idea of the family that they're trying to re reunite with, if it's safe to make sure that they're not trying to pay off passage with them, that they could go back and be in school, right? So that's also part of it. And then also public speaking, the obvious, and writing articles and essays. Now, um, I got this, this uh, quote from another fellow activist, is statistics don't move people like stories do. And it's true, right? When you put a face behind a statistic, it all of a sudden comes to, becomes you know, alive, breathes, right? And for example, we had, in New York, we did like a lot of states did. When a kid gets arrested, they go to, go to a prison that is often in a rural area really far away. Um, I was in Illinois, and this was the case. I was sent to Chicago, even though I was from down by East St. Louis. And in New York, we, put them, we sent them upstate as well. And in 2012, we came up with the Close to Home program. And it, it's basically is what it, what it sounds like. We were putting facilities within the boroughs so that um, New Yorkers could access their children through their Metro card. New Yorkers don't drive. So it was really impossible for them to see their kids before. And really this goes into detachment disorders, right? When you're so far away from your family and your community, you become detached. So the idea was to put them in the community so they can uh, immerse you know, more easily and also go to the school systems there because as it happens, when you do get out of the system, it takes a while, sometimes six months to a year even, I've heard, for those transcripts to get a kid into school. And what happens ultimately is kids drop out. Uh, I actually got my GED in prison, but not because I believed I had a future. It was just because I wanted to get on a different wing, the graduate wing. So uh, I wrote an essay basically about this protest that was happening in Queens. They were saying, we call them NIMBY folks. It stands for not in my backyard. But New Yorkers don't have backyards, most of us. <laughs> so they were not in my front yard. And they actually took to, I think the picture isn't up there, but they actually took to a protest and 
they use change.org. I like to use change.org for the Raise the Age, but I felt like they were using it, in my opinion, adversely. Uh, getting people to sign, thousands of people to sign, actually, that they didn't want this facility to go up in their borough. Now, mind you, they were going up in all the boroughs, but, uh, and this one was particularly a locked facility with nonviolent criminals. So I wanted to kind of educate them through an essay and through my story of what it was like to be detached and how, what the necessity was for them to actually be welcomed into the community. Uh, so I wrote an essay in the Daily News, and of course I got backlash from that. But I did get a couple of people thanking me for illuminating the situation. And I think as an activist, if you can just change one person's perspective on something, you've done your job that day. <laughs> so, so that is that. And now I'm gonna get into my story. And I've made a little bit of a roadmap because it's confusing. My mom still doesn't understand what fully happened. So I don't expect for you guys to really get it. So I've made a, a little roadmap to take you down through that. So I was arrested at age 15 for stealing a car. Now, you'll notice how I say I was arrested instead of I stole a car. There's a reason for that. If you look in any one of my case files, and there, there's a lot of case files, if you look in any one of them, you'll see the words master manipulator. So this has a bad, bad ring to it, right? Master manipulator, she's conniving, she's trying to get over on somebody. But when you come from a place where you don't really trust adults in the first place, and you're confiding in them, especially now in the system, if you're confiding in a caseworker, could get you put on a suicide watch or make you have to repeat a drug program. Um, manipulating actually is a survival skill. You can kind of think about it, uh, like the relationships that you guys have, right? If you guys confide in somebody about being sad, they might tell you, you know, something about their history, how they overcame. Well, that doesn't happen in the system because as you've heard some of these panelists say before, they're not allowed to indulge in their personal histories. It's very one-sided. So when you're telling somebody your feelings, they're also keeping a score, right? They're, they're keeping their paperwork as they're supposed to. And it, it does feel like they're keeping a score. And that score could add up to you know, suicide watch, another group therapy, and God knows we have a, a lot of those in the system. So did I steal the car? I'm gonna let you guys decide that one. So um, I'm gonna flash back a couple of years uh, because as it happens, a lot of our problems uh, in juvenile custody didn't start when we got arrested. It starts long before. And so when I was 12, my large family of eight, my parents got divorced and we were shattered. We, everybody went in different directions and I went with my mom to a trailer park. And I also got transferred to a new school. So at the same time that I'm going to this new school, I'm not finding new friends. I used to be in all the sports you can imagine, and now I'm not getting into sports. Um, the politics were, my mom liked to say small, small town politics, that the coach's daughters got on the teams, or the, the parents of the PTA, those, those kids got on the teams. So all of a sudden, I have all this extra idle time. And simultaneously, my mom is, falling deeper and deeper into alcoholism. She has what you could call flavors of the week all the time. And, you know, I start self-medicating myself by smoking weed. This is, my, this is my thing. And at the same time, I ended up acquiring friends from a neighboring town. And this was actually really good for me. You know, I think it's a, a really basic instinct to want to belong to a tribe. So I think finding friends was really good for me. And so everything looked like it was gonna be okay. And I didn't find out until I attended a basketball team with these, these friends was, were from a neighboring town. And so I didn't find out until I attended a basketball uh, game with them in my town that I lived in a really racist town and my new friends were black. And it was almost overnight. People that didn't pay attention to me before now made, made it you know, their goal to call me a wigger or a gangbanger, or you name it, a 90s rap song, and my name was inserted in, in it somehow. So I become emboldened by, by my anger. I wanna fight everybody, you know? Like, how can they talk about my friends? I get to eat at their houses. You know, a side note, my mom was bulimic, so food was the devil in my house. So now I have these friends that are like giving me hand-me-downs, they're amazing, and, and everybody's talking, you know, smack about them. So I fight, I fight, and fight enough until I get expelled from school. And so here I am in an alternative school. And, and the first week there, a classmate leans over and says, hey, are you one of those wigger girls? And I'm like, 
like, oh, no, you know, not again, please, I don't want to fight at this place. And she's like, no offense, you know, I don't, I don't mean any harm. I just was wondering, you know, if you hang out with the blacks, maybe you know where to get some crack. And I was like, what? You know, like, uh, I, I ignore her, but then she gives me a proposition. She says, I'll let you borrow my car if you bring it back with some crack. And I was like, oh, okay, now we're talking. So I, so I take her up on the deal. Now, she was partially crack, like in the community, I did see crack. You know, I'd also um, been running away and I had been in trap houses. I saw what it did to people. There was no way in hell I was ever gonna ask for crack from anybody. But I was gonna borrow her car because I felt like a payback for her being racist, right? So I take the car, I'm 15, never drove before, no license, wind in my hair, it's the best. And you know, the time's coming where I need to get the car back, but maybe I'll take it out a little longer. And so I, I'm thinking I'm gonna go ahead and show off, right? And I go to a friend's house, a notorious place where I'd been picked up on some of my runaway stints, so I wasn't really thinking that the car would ever be reported stolen. So cops arrive, and my instinct as a runaway is to run. So. I'm a 15 year old, the cop's a grown man. He catches up with me. And at the end I had resisting arrests, obstruction of a peace officer, um, car theft, stolen property for the items in the car, and the kicker was paraphernalia because there were crack pipes in the glove box. So here I am at detention, right? This is the next step. And um, when I go to when I go to court, my public defender, you know, I'm telling him like, look, you know, I'll take whatever it is. I'm a convict all day. That's cool. Just not a crackhead. You got to get the crack pipes off my record. And he tells me, no, the crack pipes are the best thing I have going for me. And here my mom is crying, right? And he tells me, look, if you claim those crack pipes, you get an alternative sentence of rehab instead of going to jail. And by the way, I'm in the detention center a couple weeks by now, and we're eating three meals a day. I know where I'm sleeping that night, and I'm, everybody's telling me prison food is better. So I'm kind of thinking like, you know, if my mom wasn't here, I might have been like, no, no deal. Let me, let me get the sentence. But I take it, right? I'm thinking maybe, maybe for her, maybe we'll try this. So I go to rehab. And so something magical actually happens while I'm in rehab. Through letters, the relationship with my mother actually was getting really good. You know, she's no longer cutting off in alcoholic rages. She's writing me back full letters. We're actually communicating, and it's looking good, actually. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe I will get through this. You know, maybe I'll succeed. So I get with the program, you know, hi, my name is Gigi. I'm an addict, and my drug of choice is that manipulator part, right? Crack, right? <laughs> so. So here I am, and the way it happens in rehab um, is they don't tell you that you're gonna get um, released any day. What happens is you, as, as in most in youth institutions, you work on a trek system, like a level system. So you start on the third level, it, you know, it goes either way. Maybe you're working your way down or working your way up, but whatever way it is, it's to complete the program and to get privileges. And so I'm working my way through the program. I'm on the highest level. And with, they don't tell you when you're gonna get out because the idea is if they tell you you're gonna get out on Friday, you might tell your friend, I'll bring you some drugs on Monday. So it's a surprise. You could wake up any day and you're there like, your mom's in the parking lot. I expected that any day. In fact, I'm on such a high level that um, me and my roommate are both taken to the county fair with a couple of other kids on the in, in the boys unit. And it was amazing, you know, and we had a great time. And on the way back, um, one of the male staff members tells me to stay behind and tells the other people to go up with the other staff member. And what he tells me is, I'm so beautiful. And he takes my hand and he brushes it across his, you know, the bulge in his khakis. And let me tell you, this was flattering. This wasn't like disgusting to me. It was great, you know. I'm a highly sexual, sexually charged 15 year old and I think this guy likes me. You know, I did a number for my self esteem. And he was like, you know, let's keep this, let's keep this a secret. And I'm thinking, okay. So um, my roommate who claimed she had spidey senses from all the drugs she did, she noticed that, what he did. And she um, dredged out of me what he had said that night. And I told her and she flipped. She thought, you know, he's gonna rape me, and then he's gonna rape her, and then, you know, if I didn't tell, she would. She had been the victim of rape. A family friend had raped her, and she thought any man that age, that liked a girl my age, was gonna rape. 
So there was a clause in, in um, one of the ways that you can get uh, kicked out is withholding vital information. So I'm thinking, damn, like I'm gonna get kicked out if I don't tell, or you know, so or if she tells, you know, it's, it's a lose lose. So I'm like, oh, okay, I'll tell. So the next day, I confide in my counselor, and my counselor asked me, "This is your secret? Nobody else knows." And not wanting to get my roommate involved, I say, "No, nobody else knows." So she sends me to breakfast, and within the hour, two cops come and they say my name, Blanchard. And so if you can imagine like how fast like a chair moves and a back door opens, that was how fast I ran out. <laughs> and so here I am trying to run in my house slippers. Again, they catch up. So it's back to detention for me. And just as a side note, um, I did um, in another institution later, because we all cycle, seem to cycle through and meet each other again and again. Um, one of the girls that was there said that my roommate kind of realized what was happening and she told and she was telling everybody what happened. The male staff had actually only got moved to the boys unit and then she ended up getting kicked out too. So you could speculate, but that's what it was. So I was back into the detention center. And of course I'm thinking, damn, you know, I'm gonna go and get this sentence to my 21st birthday. And I should have just ran, you know, one more time smoking is what I'm thinking. And so I meet a girl in the detention center who, you know, is facing big time too, and we conspired to, to break out. So we're not very smart. We're making our plans underneath the door, and unbeknownst to us, there's a speaker listening to us. And so the plan was is that she was going to break um, a shampoo glass is how we got our shampoo. And she was going to break it, and she was going to call a staff into her room screaming mouse, and she, she, like, we're little 15 year olds, by the way. And she was gonna, you know, threaten him and to come and get me out of the room. And we were gonna threaten our way out of like three locked doors. That was the plan. So she calls for the mouse, and the staff come, and because they heard us, she gets put in a, in a straight jacket. And then they come to my room and put me in a straight jacket. So there's that. And so when I go to court to go get my sentence, I'm thinking, you know, wow, I'm, I'm definitely getting my sentence now, and I'm probably gonna get it without parole. So you can imagine my surprise when I go to court and the judge said, he reminds me, you know, the, we only had one female prison at the time uh, for juveniles. And he reminds me like all the gangbangers and murderers from East St. Louis to Chicago are there. It's no place from you. And mind you, this is like the eve of the super predator rhetoric. So we are over, you know, over full everywhere. He says there's no place for me and he's gonna give me another chance. He's gonna put me on house arrest. Now this might sound like great news, but it wasn't for me because I felt really guilty. I had watched as many of my peers were getting sent upstate for uh, truancy, for fighting. And I didn't know what to call it then, but I know what to call it now, and that was white privilege. I was definitely getting out earlier than a lot of my black and brown um, counterparts. So um, not only did that feel bad, like a survivor's guilt, but also if you get out of jail early and you have all of these charges against you, it looks bad. So if any of my friends were gonna, to get busted for anything, they're gonna look at me as a narc. So it was a very paranoid time for me. So I get back home and I'm thinking, you know, at least this relationship is better with my mom. So as it happens, good things with my mom had a shelf life of a couple of days. And back come the drugs, back comes the chaos. And it's really like another prison with her, worse than I felt the tension would be and how great DOC sounded too. But, um, and also I don't have my, my escape mechanism. I can't smoke now because I'm getting tested all the time. Now I have to deal with my problems, you know? And uh, so I get off, I, I, I think it was 45 days that I was on house arrest. And I get off and I'm at a friend's house. They're all smoking weed inside. And I'm sitting on the porch so I don't get it in my, you know, my bloodstream. And one of my friend's uncles hands me a pipe and says, smoke this. It gets out of your system in a couple of days. So I take the pipe and I'm about to smoke. And then I smell that smell. I know that smell. It's crack. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm 15 and I almost just smoke crack. And it dawns on me like, I'm not smart enough to be out on my own. You know, like I'm, 
I'm sleeping around. I sleep with an uh, older man if they'll give me food and a place to sleep on their runaway stints. You know what I mean? I put myself in so many dangerous situations. I'm not smart enough to be out. And there's this place that will feed me every day that I don't have to do these things for. And I'm thinking, you know, for one last hoorah, I'm going to go with some friends on a weed run to California. And so we do that. And I think we actually passed Phoenix. So maybe that was my first time here. I don't know. But um, so... Um, so on the way back, actually, we stopped to go to the bathroom, and I get out, and I see this bush that has these weird bug lights in it, and I go to approach it, and that, at that same time, my friend turns on the headlights of the car, and I realize this is the side of a mountain, and those lights are cars coming up switchback. So it was even more evidence, like, I'm not smart enough to be out here. So I get home. And I turn myself in. My mom's begging me, you know, stay till after Christmas. And I'm like, no, I'm terrified of freedom at this point. No, I need to go in. So I get my sentence. Oh, I think I'm going backwards now. So, yes, back in detention, of course, always, right? So I'm back in prison, or I'm in prison now. And um, I was warned a lot about the kids there. You know, these are murderers. And, yeah, I did have roommate murderers. And, you know, but... I started to find out that it wasn't the inmates that I needed to be afraid of. What was happening with the inmates is, and, and what I'm now working in institutions have found it's very common, when you take a child out of their family unit and out of their, their support systems, they quickly move to reassign those roles. So it was within months, uh, probably, not, probably within weeks actually, that I had a jail sister. I had somebody I called mama. I had somebody I called papa, brother. And these were girls that played masculine parts. Like it was a very intricate subculture. And there was a, rules just like every community. You know, you can only have one best friend. You can only have one sister. You know, all these things. And this is my new family. And all of a sudden, I'm, not, I'm even popular. And I'm finding you know, this amazing support system, people who care about me and tell me they care about me all the time. You know what I mean? And this is amazing. And the people that I had to be aware of were the guards. And, you know, there's caveats and everything. There was some benevolent guards, don't get me wrong, And but maybe you guys have heard of the term cognitive dissonance. And I do think that the majority did treat us like obstacles. And there was, in particular, um, a guard that had it out for my prison sister. She worked for the warden, and there was rumors that she was, you know, doing favors for favors. I'm not at liberty to discuss. She didn't claim it or deny it. Nonetheless, she never got confinement, and she had all these privileges. And now that I'm her sister, I start reaping those benefits. And so this guard in particular would lay out traps, you know, and if somebody was smoking on the unit, she tried to pin it on us. Now, if you, I don't know if you guys know this, but any write-up goes to the parole board with you. So anything, anything that a, a guard can write up about you could essentially, you know, translate to you staying there longer. Um, so, so yeah, so uh, people also ask me, like, abuse, did abuse happen? I wanna say that it's really hard to call things abuse um, when you're getting punished for it. So just a couple examples, like we have a girl down the hall that is giving below jobs in exchange for coke. And when she gets caught, she gets sent to confinement for four months. This guard gets let, let go. There's no court case. When she gets out after four months, she even has like a bald spot in the back of her head because she'd been in confinement for so long. And the same thing happens with another girl. Uh, she gets caught with a disposable camera that the math teacher gave her to take nudies with. She goes to confinement for a while. So. When you see that we're the ones getting published, pu uh, punished for that, at the time, you don't look at it as abuse. You know what I mean? So we're going to go forward. And um, my counselor brings me in, and she tells me, I'm, she tells me the obvious, that my mom is deemed unfit. I'm thinking, duh. But she says, because of that, I won't be getting paroled home. I'll be getting paroled to a group home. And of course, my first thought is like, well, we could have skipped prison and just did this a long time ago, right? But the tragedy wasn't, you know, that I went to prison. The tragedy is that there wasn't an alternative in the first place, I think, you know. Um, so I find this out that I'm going to a group home, and all of a sudden I realize my prison family is pulling away from me. 
And I started asking around, like, what the hell? Like, why is everybody pulling away from me? And friends are telling me, oh, it's because you're getting out soon. You know, it's, it doles the pain. People pull away. And I'm like, but, you know, I, I see girls here. You know, we're, it's, everything is overcrowded. All the group homes are overcrowded. Prison is overcrowded. I've seen girls waiting six months to a year for that group home bed to open. I'm going to be here for six months to a year. And, of course, my friend tells me, oh, no, you're a white girl. You're going to go, like, right away. And she was right. I, and again, I skipped all these people that had already been waiting. And as it happens, these uh, group home people come and they interview you, kind of like a college recruitment process. And at the end of the day, they choose who they're going to take to their group home. So when I went to the group home, I went with two other white girls. And of course, it's this, you know, this really terrible feeling. And um, as was tradition, in prison, your prison family is supposed to write you these really long letters, 45 page books almost. And the idea behind it is, because in your next placement you're gonna be really lonely. And this book is, you know, a coping mechanism. You're gonna read about what you meant to people slowly, you know? Delinquents are allowed to contact other delinquents. So essentially, that relationship that I've had for a little over a year is just going to be gone right when I left. But at least I had this, you know? And it was actually, it, it, it actually wasn't permitted, but a lot of guards just let it happen because, you know, they understood what it was. But the guard that had it out for my sister in particular requested to take us that day. And she gets into my pr prison luggage. If you guys don't know what prison lug luggage is, it's a trash bag. So that's what we use when we go from home to home is a trash bag. It's never even full of all the stuff that we own. And she goes in there and goes right for these goodbye letters and puts them in a trash can and pours coffee on them. And so this is, this is particularly devastating to me. And I also had journaled and stuff like that, too. And all that stuff was in there. So I felt like all this stuff had been ripped from me. So on my way to a group home, which is supposed to be a good thing, I feel like it's an awful thing. And all I'm thinking about is how I'm going to get back into prison. You know, how am I going to get back to see my family? I can't lose them, you know? And so I'm at the group home, and I'm pretty depressed. And the psychiatrist starts putting me on all types of meds, and it becomes hazy for a while. And I really can't even tell you stuff about that time because that's how hazy it was. And eventually, I started getting nosebleeds, and they took me off the meds. So in this moment of clarity, um, I something happens similar from before. I, um, a pass is made at me from a male staff member. You better believe I don't tell this time. And I'm just as flattered as last time. And so we begin our, our sexual relationship. And I know as an adult, you can look at it what it is now, but it felt like love to me then. I felt special, you know, that I'm this kid and, and he likes me, you know? And it was really actually good for my, for, for my depression. I felt like it actually got me out of a depression as sad as that sounds. So this goes on for a while. I'm in the group home for about a year. I get an in independent living. And some of the clauses in independent living is you have to get a job. And this town is a lot like the one I came from. We kids from the group home are skid marks in their town. Hell no, they're not going to let us buy a cash register. And no, we're not going to you know, hire you. So we actually found Burger King was the one that would hire all of us. And the manager ironically said, we were the best. Like, he would hire any of us because if we don't show up to work, we had a parole officer to answer to. So, hell yeah, he's going to hire us. So, we were all pretty much working there. And so, as I'm getting into independent living, I'm kind of going back to my old ways. You know, I'm, I'm promiscuous. I'm thinking, you know, sleeping with somebody, at least tonight, I feel like I'm loved. You know, outside of a counselor, I have nobody checking on, on me. I don't have a relationship with my family. It is done by this time. And uh, so uh, my parole officer tells me, because the new laws are being changed to decrease the overcrowding, that they are scrolling back my max out date. It's actually, it's called emancipation. <laughs> so we get emancipated when we age out. And they're scrolling back my emancipation date from 21 to 19. Again, this is not good news for me, because here I am thinking like, oh no, I only have one more year before I'm cut off completely. Like, I'm gonna work at Burger King for the rest of my life, and now a counselor is not even gonna call me. And I'm thinking, damn, I, I still haven't been able to contact my, my prison family. I thought I had like three more years to decide when I wanted to go back. Because going back always stayed an option for me. So I quickly revoke my parole. Like within weeks, I fail a piss test and I'm like ready to go. And my counselor's trying to give me a second chance, like just you know, come back next week. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna fail that one too. Like let's, let's just, let's do it. So I go back to prison. And things have changed there. Um, 
a lot of my own, because I'm actually 18 at this time, I have to sit in the county jail for a week. If they would have sent me to the county jail first, I probably would have stayed out because that was really scary. But um, so back in prison, things are different. And my prison family's gone, most of them. Um, that guard that was really nasty to me is all of a sudden really nice to me. And it's really bizarre, but she wants to reminisce about the good old times all the time. She wants to reminisce about how great things used to be. And it starts to dawn on me like, oh my gosh, like this is what she looks forward to. This is her life. And, and I hadn't seen that before. I thought that she was just an evil person. But now I realize kind of like at high school, this, this is her life. And instead of like hating her, I kind of felt pity for her at that point. And um, I don't think that she's an anomaly. But um, so that's borrowed time. I get paroled and then I go home and I just want to pull up this slide with the trash bag on it because the trash bag becomes very symbolic. You know, when you leave and everything that you own uh, fits into a trash bag, you start to feel like this is my life. You know, this is how I view myself and this is how the community views me. And so I'm back at home and it's not, it doesn't really feel like home. Some things had happened while I was away and that um, all these factories were going overseas, right? And the um, people that could move away didn't. And the people that could, that had to stay, um, started falling to, you know, selling drugs. And there became a really big heroin epidemic. And all of a sudden, these kids that had really kind of pushed me out of their inner circles were now heroin addicts. And people were dying of o overdoses. You know, these are high school students, by the way. And my mom thinks, you know, wow, like that didn't happen to you. Maybe all that happened wasn't so bad. Maybe you dodged a bullet. So the chaos that had been there before because of that was gone. So it wasn't as nasty as it had been before, but it's not home, you know? I feel like I'm tolerated there. And so I get a job at McDonald's and I'm thinking, I'm gonna go find my prison sister. And McDonald's isn't enough to, to move. So I start selling weed. I'm thinking, they're looking at heroin. They're not going to look at a weed dealer, right? So I get enough money to move. And it's actually my weed dealer who introduces me to his aunt. She, I don't think, knew anything about his dealings. But this woman had come from poverty and had put herself through school. And all of a sudden, she's reaching out to me and wanting to be my mentor. And let me tell you, like, when you come from a place where nobody's doing good with their lives, it's really hard to look for something good in yourself, to, to reach for anything, you know? I could have just kept selling drugs for all I cared, you know? But um, this woman kind of believed in me, and I tell her that I'm there to find my long-lost sister. <laughs> and we're sitting at her table, going through the phone book, looking for this girl. And while we're looking for her, Crime Stoppers comes on, and she flashes on the screen. And then my, this woman is like, is that who you're looking for? And I was like, oh, dang, yes. And I came clean to her. I just told her everything. And I figured she's going to tell me to get the hell out of her house, Don't want me around, doesn't want me around her kids, right? She did the opposite. She says, Crime Stoppers is usually old. She's probably in county jail. Why don't we see if she's there? Her idea was, if she's going to help me out of my situation, she might as well help her, too. And so it was just like, whoa, like you're not gonna see me for the criminal that I am. And she saw potential in me. And it really was this woman who I started, who allowed me to start seeing that I had potential. And, you know, um, I started getting in, into college. And she is the first person to like hold me accountable, you know? Like if I, I can't do math and oh, this college is too hard for me, she's like, uh, too bad, get up and do it, you know? I can't find a ride to get to work and then to school all right, I'll be there, I'll pick you up. So she really did become this backbone. And while all this great stuff is happening, I fall in love with my college sweetheart. Another hard learned lesson. Girls like me who do not have strong family bonds often become targeted for guys who seek to control them. So this college sweetheart was really beautiful at first. You know, he wanted to be the family I never had. He wanted to see me out of my goodwill clothes and into name brands. You know, I ate steak for the first time. And it was really amazing. And then overnight it turned violent. And all of a sudden I'm his prisoner and he threatens to kill me if I leave and anybody who wants to intervene. So I'm telling my mentor, oh, I'm just so much in love. That's why you don't see me. Really, it's I don't want her to see the bruises, you know? And you know, the manip manipulator part again, right? And so this goes on for a while, and I start to realize, even a year, and it's getting really bad, and I realize, yeah, okay, he might kill me if I leave, but he's definitely going to kill me if I stay. And so I come clean. I call my mentor, and I tell her everything. 
and she doesn't pass judgment. She comes and gets me. You know, I escaped from him, and she came and get me. And she was like, "I'm not scared of him. Come, move in with me. Like, you, we'll do this together." Again, this amazing, amazing person. You know, and um, I end up checking into. Um, first, I checked into the hospital because she had convinced me I had a concussion. And when you go to an ER. Uh, for admissions of advi violence, especially in Illinois, they have to call the police. So now I'm in too deep. Now there's a police report, and I am thinking maybe I have to go through with it. And I go to the woman's shelter, and that first night there, wrapped in sheets, I'm like, damn, I'm back in my group home past. Like, I thought I was going to do something good with my life, but no. Here I am back here, right? So I decided I have to stick with it. I have to stick with these charges. I have to stay with him. And had it not really been for this woman, I don't think I could have done it. Because, this per because of course, the guy doesn't stay in jail, right? And to protect myself, I probably would have went back with him. But instead, again, I have this person, right? And so we get through it. And I finish college. And the day after college, I move to New York. I get a job that allows me enough financial freedom to travel. And every new country I'm going to, I'm thinking, wow, you know, like, I almost missed this. Like, this, most of my peers will never see this. You know, a lot of them are in adult prisons by this time. And I'm thinking, you know, I know that I have to pay it forward. But I was afraid to go back near the system because I felt like, it was a vacuum, and if I got too close to it, it would suck me back in. So I allowed myself enough time and distance until I could go back and start working in the system. And so, really, if I leave you guys with anything today, I want to say if you have the chance to be a mentor for, for somebody, you don't know when you'll change their path. You know, I, I've made it my life's goal to plant the seed that was planted in me and somebody else. So please, if you guys have that opportunity, I encourage you to take it. So that's all I have. Oh, and here's this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.